We are here at the uh, CEO Forum. The CEO Forum is a relatively new adventure at, at SID. Second uh, year. Second year. Uh, and it's really our goal to bring the um, sort of audience scope to a new level. Because as you know, we have a great technical program at Display Week. We have great opportunities listening to scientists, to engineers, to product owners. But we also wanted to expand that envelope to the people that actually run those companies and give some perspective on the topics that burn in their hearts. I know in my case, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've built a number of companies in the display sector. And so it's nice to come to a conference that teaches you all about the how to do it in terms of technology. But we also provide money for it. We need to find you know, financing. We need to find customers, strategic partners. And so the... Um, CEO Forum is a mechanism to talk about those kind of topics. So it's a d delight to see a great roster of candidates that Sri will introduce in a second and then interview of people who have been there at the coal phase and had their success, had their failures, had their challenges. Uh, at least I had my failures. I'm not sure. These guys, maybe these guys have been just successful all day long. And uh, sharing that experience. So thank you very much all for attending. Thank you to our speakers in advance. And Sri, it's your show. Thank you so much. I think you can. I use this because I have fallen off podiums before. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so let's get started. Um, thank you for participating in that exercise. Um, when we started this program, my fear was that uh, is this um, uh, room, um, uh, in the past we've had very large rooms, uh, you know, and we didn't have, uh, the people were spread out and things like that. This time I said, the best problem I can have is we are gonna overflow and somebody will complain to Helga or to myself saying we didn't plan better. That would be a good problem to have. I think we still have a lot of seats here. Those of you standing in the back, there are seats up here, no problem. Uh, with that, um, let me introduce our panel. David Dutton is CEO of Silvaco. Uh, his company makes uh, software products uh, for engineers to design, and uh, uh, they are involved in many, many different aspects of the display industry. David himself has got a lot of background, and he will expand on his background when he comes up on the podium. David, welcome, please. Robert McIntyre is with LG Ventures. He is here not only to represent uh, 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 the venture aspect uh, of uh, uh, of our industry in terms of uh, how he looks at companies, how he looks at uh, you know who to fund and those kind of things. But also, he's been CEO of uh, more than one startup in the past, and he can relate to many of the experiences some of you may go through, and that's why Rob is here. Welcome, Rob. <laughs> Andrew Scully is probably known to many of you. He's CEO of Imagine. Uh, publicly traded company, and he'll bring a slightly different perspective as compared to a private company. And uh, Andrew's got many, many years of experience. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So what we're going to do today is I uh, have a set of questions. Some of them I have shared with the panel, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, some of them they don't know about. Um, and uh -oh. obviously the questions that you're going to ask, they don't know about. And so we'll keep this fun and uh, somewhat informal. Uh, I had to give out awards, that's why I'm dressed like this. Otherwise, for this particular session, my preference would be we would be in much more casual kind of clothes because this is like, I'm trying to make this slightly different from our typical SID session. Okay? With that, uh, let me request Andrew to start by expanding on your background from your days at Kodak and uh, uh, up to today. Well, it's a long time. I will shorten it because I had... Uh, about 20 years in, in the uh, OLED display industry. I uh, joined the uh, Kodak's uh, OLED display and uh, shortly after that ran it. We had a joint venture with Sanyo in Japan. Uh, Sanyo ran into some, uh, oh, we put the first direct pattern active matrix display in a camera. I still have one and those of you who know OLED, there are no black spots in that uh, display at the moment and that's been many years. And I uh, uh, was asked by the CEO after the Sanyo venture didn't work because their backplane plant had to be uh, given to a joint venture with Seiko Epson. And uh, I was asked by the CEO to uh, give him some scenarios for new uh, 
uh, manufacturing, what could we do? And Kodak didn't have the money to do it, so when Imagine said, would you please come and join us, I said yes. So Imagine's micro displays, we've been at this for very many years. Today we have the brightest micro displays and the AR, VR industry is interested in us. So we're very excited, very happy. Rob? Yeah, so uh, I'll start with an apology. Uh, uh, first, my, my career is not in display, so a lot of what I'll say today is uh, more general to startups and, and venture investing. Uh, in, I have about a 20-year career. Uh, so far, about half that time was spent uh, in venture capital uh, from 01 uh, to 08, and then uh, started up again uh, in 2012. Um, and then I did three startups as well. Uh, first, as a, as a junior business development guy, at a company called Airwave that sold to Aruba Networks. Um, and then uh, af after my VC fund where I was a partner uh, hit, hit uh, some troubled times in 2008, I was uh, a senior manager at a company called uh, NextBio, uh, which sold, sold to Illumina uh, uh, in 2012. So uh, I, again, I bring some of that mix of experience from, from uh, uh, some, some battles on the, on the startup side as, as well as the VC. Uh, just quickly on LG Technology Ventures, we have a $425 million fund. We invest uh, in series A and B rounds, uh, write checks of one to 10 million. Uh, we have a, uh, a local investment committee, com excuse me, committee. We're GPLP with the five LG companies that are LPs in our fund. Uh, we move very quickly on investments. We've uh, made six uh, in our short tenure. We just started this uh, late uh, this past summer. Uh, and in four of those six deals, we've gone from first meeting to CEO, with CEO, to uh, actually wiring the funds within two months. So uh, if I leave you with anything, we're, uh, we're a CVC that, uh, that acts very much like a financial VC and can move uh, and be dynamic like that. There are certainly um, individuals here that have startup companies that you're gonna get calls from. Thank you yeah, so yeah. <laughs> David? Great. Did you say 10 million? Yeah, yeah one to 10, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got my checkbook, right? Okay, perfect, perfect. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks, for, yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, I'm, I'm Dave Dutton, uh, I'm with Silvaco. Uh, I've been in the semiconductor industry since 1984, so I joined more on the integrated circuit side. I'm a process engineer for most of my life, mostly in etching, a little bit in deposition. Uh, I started at Intel, was there about 10 years, and then went to Maxim Integrated Products, uh, helped them with uh, moving to multi-level metal. So I was back kind of in the one and a half micron era down to about the 180 nanometer era. So um, quite, quite, ancient in some ways. Uh, from there, I actually uh, joined a startup that was doing semiconductor equipment. Uh, I'd helped interface with Intel, a lot of companies bringing equipment into Intel. Uh, did that for almost 20 years and wound up being CEO of a pub. We went public and was part of a, you know, CEO of the public company for, I ran it for 11 years, that way I retired and was doing a number of consulting things kind of in clean tech. And every time I came back and worked in semiconductor, I really, realized that's where my blood was. And I joined Silvaco about, about uh, four and a half years ago. And we do uh, essentially uh, simulation and design software for semiconductors and display. We're, we're really the leader in display. And we do help simulate ma new materials as well as you know, structures that, that, that you may build for a, for a display on into the design of the, the circuits, the display layout, and then verifying that that works. So we're really passionate about this industry. And, looking forward to the panel as well. Yeah, thank Thanks. you so much. For those of you who are standing in the back, there are plenty of seats right here in the front. And besides, you can heckle us much better if you're here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. um, OK, we'll start with the theme uh, for today's panel session, which is uh, succeeding in the display industry. So my first question that any of you could take is, what does it take to succeed in the display industry? Um, Andrew? Yeah, I, I think uh, for the teams I was a part of that uh, you had to invent new technology and keep it going. I've always uh, been very proud of both the Kodak team to be a member of that and the Imagine team. We have team members who will go out of their way to do what it takes to get to the next step. And if uh, one of us is uh, having trouble, the other guy comes in to do it. So it, it is very important in this industry you have to invent new technology, and we've managed to, to do that uh, terrifically, hire new people who will keep that technology going. So I'm very much a team person, and that has been very successful in both uh, my Codex day and the Imagine. I'll, I'll speak from, 
uh, the perspective of us and, and LG uh, Display, uh, if, if you want to be successful in our sphere, uh, you know, one is you need to have a technology that uh, is not only uh, you know, unique, um, disruptive, uh, but something that uh, it'd be very hard for someone for L at LG Display to say, you know, we can do that here. So you, you've got to have something that gets past the NIH, uh, which can be a very high bar. Um, uh, the second thing is you have to be you know, patient um, and, uh, because a big company like LG, if you haven't already dealt with them, can be extremely slow. Um, and, and that, you know, the time frames in which they operate are not the same as the time frames uh, in which startups typically operate. So uh, you have to be good at multitasking, realizing that when you send an email to somebody at LGD, it may take two weeks for a very simple answer to come, come back. So just parallel process that with engagements you have with other big display uh, manufacturers or other partners that you have. Thank you. Dave, your company doubled in size uh, yeah. in the last 12 months. Yeah. Uh, with you in the CEO role. Your chairman was very proud to talk about this uh, not so uh, long ago, and you kept your resources somewhat uh, you know, mm -hmm. similar to what you had before. So what did you do to succeed? Yeah, I think a, a couple of things, and I'll try and tie back into display too, but I think uh, for us, you know, part of being successful, I think, is one, focusing on leadership, right? So when you focus on leadership, market leadership, whether it be niche or a bigger market, you're really thinking, okay, what, what can I provide value that people want, right? Where are people going and how can I make, help them get there? So I think that helps orient a company to focus on products that are valuable. And also we're very proud of being a very open, transparent, uh, you, know, you know, no holds barred, being, being really uh, open to understand the truth and solve the problems. And I think that's what's critical. It creates a team that is focused to win. And if I carry that a little further, because we, we work in a lot of different areas. We work, like I said, with semiconductor, you know, ICE integrated circuit manufacturers and designers, display designers, you know, solar and so on. Um, I think display also has its own characteristics. It's very fast moving, as, as uh, Andrew mentioned. Uh, you know, so part of what we have to do is provide value. You know, in other words, a learning curve has to increase through simulation. So, you know, uh, at the technical level, a, a display uh, company can learn like in 10 days. And so we have to have very fast, but working on very new materials, you're, you're kind of breaking the, the very leading edge. And at the same time, uh, you know, be somewhat, I, I wouldn't say secretive, but everybody has their own secret sauce. And so, uh, you know, working as a team, as you say, but across the industry is always a challenge to keep that trust. But I think the display industry is really dynamic and, and really fun and challenging. And that's why you see, uh, you know, as, as here, this is a very technical show. We see a lot of that in display because it is still a very fast evolving technology. Sure, certainly. So when we created this theme, I deliberately did not say that this is uh, how a company succeeds uh, in the industry, but it, I also wanted to make sure there is um, enough um, discussion on how you as an individual can also succeed in the industry, right? So we have an audience comprised of uh, I, I see more than one CEO here in the audience, and I also see individuals that are a little bit earlier in their career. From that perspective, um, so I'll switch the questions back and forth between company and the individual, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I'll still stick with the company theme. What are some traits that uh, you would see for, uh, for a successful company? Rob, you're probably most apt to answer because you see a lot of companies mm -hmm. uh, come at you and ask for funding. And what are some early indications that you say, you know what, I think this company uh, is going to be successful? What are some things? Yeah, so, so um, you know, the first thing, when you think about venture capital, what we're trying to do coming in as, as early stage investors is we're trying to make a 10x return on, uh, on the capital we put in. So that's, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, and that, so that means we have to build big companies. We're, you know, with every shot on goal, we're very much, again, like a financial uh, or institutional VC. You know, we're, uh, we're looking to make a billion dollar company, a multi-billion dollar company, a $10 billion uh, market value company. Uh, and that requires a number of things. So when, the, when we meet them in the early stage, uh, again, one is, you know, the disruptive nature of the underlying technology. We can't, what we're looking at can't be an incremental step. It can't be, uh, you know, two times, three times better than an existing technology. It's really got to be order of magnitude in at least one dimension and maybe multiple dimensions. Um, uh, the next thing is, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people uh, f fail to look at this. They see kind of the initial disruptive nature of the technology. The second part is the sustained 
uh, nature of that uh, disruption or the moat that you build. Now, the moat that you build may not necessarily be technological. It could be you know, sales and marketing. It could be execution on your software. It could be great design. Uh, but you have to have a plan to go from where you are, hey, I believe that my technology is better than anybody else's, uh, to a place where in five, 10 years, if you've been successful, you've basically given a blueprint to competitors to, figure, you know, to follow, and you've created a market that is now of interest to a lot of people. You might be the first, you know, starting today, you might be the only one to realize that this market is worth going after, but that's not gonna be true in, in three, five years. So you, have to, so you have to initially think about how am I gonna build that moat over time? And it could be IP, I mean, that happens a lot in, in hardware space, but it's gotta, it's gotta be something. Um, the th a thing that uh, a lot of startups, uh, frankly, most of the startups that we, we talk to are lacking, uh, even though they have great technologies, is product market fit. And I'm not saying anything that's, you know, groundbreaking here, but I, I really want to emphasize this because there's just so many, again, with, the, with the, the business plans that we see, there's so many companies that have a solution to a problem that doesn't exist and will never exist, <laughs> right? I, I, and, is, and you're just constantly looking for how do I take this thing that I have and solve a problem? Well, if you don't understand the end market or if you don't have advisors that understand the end, end market who can explain you know, okay, here's what's going on, here are the bottlenecks, here are the challenges, uh, then you have, no, you have no context. You're just, you know, someone out there with a widget pitching a widget. Um, uh, so, so that, I mean, that one thing, if you're doing a new, if you're thinking about starting a new company, pay more attention, frankly, to that than anything else, you know, I, I'm about to say. Uh, and the last thing, again, is, 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 as these guys mentioned, people. Um, you know, I, I think to start a company requires a certain amount of bravado, um, uh, you know, some ball holes, <laughs> you know, frankly. Um, and, and you have to be, um, you know, I, or, or, or put it this way, uh, when I pattern match against all the successful CEOs that I've uh, backed or that I've talked to, seen, been, been exposed to, um, they've all been a little bit, or maybe a lot, unrealistic or unreasonable. Um, you know, they, they don't take no for an answer. They don't think about what's, you know, what most people think as being achievable or fitting within a box. Uh, they have very unrealistic and outsized goals and expectations, so you need that. Uh, uh, and that may be you, that may be someone you bring into the company, but you need that driving force, that person that's constantly cheerleading, saying, you know, we can do this, we can, we can change the world. Uh, simultaneously, you know, you need to start building your team again with people who have experience in the industry and who know what they're doing. They know what they're doing in sales, they've sold a product like this before, they know how to price it. They know what the comp how the competition is going to respond to the pricing. They understand you know segmentation of customers, kind of all the nitty gritty of, of the sales. Uh, and you have to know how, you have to have people who know how to make the product, actually make it, and really, not you know just bright eyed PhDs out of their out of their program. I mean, those are great, you know people with new ideas, fresh blood is great. But you have you have to have people who know how to deliver product into this market credibly. So that's. I'll, I'll stop. There's a lot more I could say. I'll, I'll stop there. I don't want to eat up the whole time. Yeah. No. Thank you, uh, Dave. You you told me that uh, you had a hiring budget for um, uh, this year, and you literally filled that quota in your first quarter. So how? Do, what were the uh, traits you were looking for among candidates that you hired? Yeah, that's a good. Uh, we were talking earlier, and I think for us, we we had a you know last year was a, was a very strong year, and sovaco has been driving very aggressive growth, and especially we've done a mix of both organic growth and so we've been investing in some key technologies and this year we wanted to staff those as well as uh, we've over the last four years we've, we've also completed six acquisitions so we've been kind of using both those as growth method methods and this year we felt okay we, we had some plans in place and we we put forth to the we put a plan in place to hire and gave the managers the, the go ahead to start and we really did within the first quarter as our, our recruiting worked better than we thought and also, I think we, we found, you know, we kind of found some talent. And for, for us, we're looking for physicists, mathematicians, uh, very strong coding people. So they're very technical, very hard people to find. I think part of it is we have not just uh, in our, our headquarters is Silicon Valley, but we look for talent around the world. So we have a number of what we call uh, R&D uh, technical centers, uh, such as Grenoble, France, um, the, near Cambridge in the UK, uh, near Vienna, Austria. Uh, in, Den uh, in Denmark and such. So we're able to search all those areas and we were in some ways lucky to find quite a bit of uh, good talent and bring them on. At the same time, it, 
you know, all of a sudden our expenses jumped up at, at in, in the first quarter, what really should have been across the year. So we've had to then react and slam down because <laughs> at the same time a business has to make money, right? So, yeah, so much, but I think, I think that being able to, you know, uh, part of it is, you know, write good job descriptions and also be open to adjust as you're, you know, as you're talking to candidates and you, you start to really get a feel for what you're looking for, be able to adjust those and then hone in on the talent. So, yeah, so. Definitely. Uh, Andrew, if I were to apply for a job in your company, right? You want hired. <laughs> <laughs> that was the answer, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, what are some uh, qualifications beyond your technical skill or whatever discipline I'm applying for that you would look for? Well, we've got uh, two sides to that. One is, uh, and we are looking for people. The uh, difficulty is on the technical side, I'll just mention that this is an Asia industry. Mm -hmm. So the people have to be willing to be where we manufacture, that's in New York State, or where we design the silicon, which is right uh, here in Santa Clara, or near here. On the other hand, we need uh, talent that knows the market. And here the market I'm talking about is augmented reality and virtual reality. And that uh, knows how to uh, work with people who are interested in that, hear what they say, tell them why we have a value proposition with these micro displays, OLED on silicon, why that fits, and then uh, come back to the company and say, you're doing something wrong when you are, you need to invent it a little <coughs> differently. So that's a type of thing. And the other question that I would ask you, which I think this fits in you, with you is, how, do you, how big is this market? It's been delayed, hasn't it? So are we realistic to think this is a, a big deal? or it isn't. And that's very important for us. How much time and effort do we put into this? Uh, and I'm not talking necessarily consumer, but there's the enterprise market, and we hear a lot of different companies are interested. So to be able to put a, a market together, how big is it? A plan on how you're gonna go after it? And not, <coughs> and again, it's not just consumer, a plan on how you're gonna go after it? And what do we need to do differently within Imagine to make the display that works. And I'll give you just one example of that. You go out to a VR company and they say what? Well, I want a wide field of view. I want to match the human eye. Okay, 40 pixels per degree, 60 pixels per degree, and I want a 100 degree field of view. I need 4,000 or 6,000. Oh, you want us to make a very small display? No, 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 the optics are too tough. Now we have to stitch the silicon, so it's not easy. So now we have to find a place to do that. That's the kind of help we need. I have a feeling I'm not qualified. What? <laughs> <laughs> he told me to tell him he was hired. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, switching to um, a more personal um, uh, you know, experiences and so on, each of you have reached a pretty significant level in your career um, in the industry. Uh, I'm sure in your career there was a fork in the road where you had to make some decisions. And um, whatever fork that you chose obviously got you to a level of success that you currently enjoy. Uh, please share some of those experiences. Uh, uh, what were other choices in career and life that you could have chosen and you chose this and got you to here? Looking to me? Oh, sorry. Okay, well, um, I guess I, I, would, I would say I have probably uh, two or three forks I've, I've had through the road. Um, actually, I started life as a geologist and, and loved doing field geology and would go out for six months at a time. Um, and of course, when you're young, you don't quite think everything through. And then when I realized I wanted a family, I thought about, wow, can I really do justice to, to my children if I'm you know, really out doing what I love? So uh, at the same time, back in those days, the semiconductor industry was really growing and looking for people. and. Uh, I, I wound up applying and, you know, kind of viewed I had, you know, a lot of physics and a lot of chemistry, so maybe this would be an industry that, that worked. I knew some people that, that were in the industry, so I, I hired on at Intel. So I made the choice to move from what I essentially really loved to a new industry. Um, and I was so afraid of why the heck would they want somebody like me that I just, for six months, studied my brains out and learned the industry. And back then I could name every process, you know, what the impurities were, what levels of dopants, the energy used to etch a certain, everything, just, just to really understand it. So that was one fork in the road, I think, and you know was a good choice for me. A little further on, when I left Intel, I had 
really helped a lot of comp equipment companies come into Intel. So I had a number of them were surprised I left and then were asking, can I join them? So I wound up, one of them was a startup and the others were more mature, well, well-known companies today. So I told my wife that, you know, it'd be fun to try a startup. So, you know, that startup experiencing making that choice was also kind of another fork in the road and really brought the opportunity where I learned a broader set of, you know, upper management skills and, you know, went and did some MBA courses and stuff and then wound up being the CEO of a public company and then continuing to grow that way. So I think, you know, those have been a few forks in the road that, you know, turned out fine for me, but, you know, they're all, I think they're all, you have to self, you know, kind of, you know, look inward and, and decide, you know, what, what, what feels best for you. So. It depends on the individual. It sure does, yeah. Um, so I'll, uh, I won't name the company, but I was uh, head of business development at a startup company and uh, came into the job, uh, was given a set of, uh, let's say, goals that I didn't exactly agree with. Uh, I had a kind of a different view for the partnerships that were going to take our company to the next level. Um, and, uh, you know, I think frequently, and this, this, I think this, is, uh, this experience is generalizable to situations that happen to a lot of people where you end up in a, in a role, you're told do X, but you have a passion for Y. Um, and and uh, I, uh, I have the benefit of, uh, 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 of a friend, this guy Jesse Robbins. He's, uh, he's known as uh, the father of DevOps. So he was at Amazon Web Services. Um, he, he basically created the, the framework in which they manage their data centers. Um, and he, uh, when he speaks, so I'm plagiarizing what he says, when he speaks, uh, he, he has a motto, and I, follow, I, use, I have this, <coughs> excuse me, this has kind of become a mantra for me. He says, uh, don't fight suck, create awesome. So no matter what, you know, in any situation that you're in, there's always going to be stuff that you don't agree with or just, just sucks for whatever reason, right? Like bureaucracy, you name it. Uh, and you can drive yourself crazy, but more importantly, you can become incredibly ineffective with your time by spending your effort and your mental cycles trying to fight the suck. Instead, you know, acquiesce to some of the suck, real, realize that some of the things that suck, you can't change. So if there are things that, you know, you're empowered to change, definitely do that. If you're the CEO of a company, your, your, your employees are coming and saying, hey, this sucks, you should really, you, you know, and you can make the change, make the change. But in a lot of times, you're in situations where you really can't, there's powers, at, you know, at play, investors, board members, whoever, you, you can't change their minds. Go with the suck. Instead, spend your time creating awesome in the area that you're passionate about. Excuse me, <clears throat> got a little bug. Uh, you're passionate about and where you know you can create huge value for your organization, whether that be you know, your startup company, your big company, you know, investment fund like I, I'm at. And over time, the awesome that you create you know, takes over and creates so much value that people just start jumping on your bandwagon. So if I can leave you one thing, you know, that's the mantra. It comes from Jesse Robbins, the father of DevOps, but it's uh, something that I uh, you know, think about frankly every day when I encounter yeah. you know suck. Oh, thank you. Oh, what's your answer? So I, I started uh, my career in uh, elementary particle physics. I was a theoretical physicist, uh, slamming protons together and trying to predict what came out. And I uh, decided that wasn't for me. Huge calculations, Monte Carlo simulations. So I took a step and went to business. So that was a fork in the road. But you know, that, that uh, physics was not wasted at all because it allowed me every job I was in, I would expand what I'm doing. If I, I had a manufacturing process, I wanted to learn about it. So when you expand what you're doing, you get more opportunities. And that's what happened to me. I was, uh, did finance, I did uh, strategic planning, I did uh, managing operations, and now a, a CEO of a company that's very technically oriented. And the uh, second fork in the road was uh, deciding to leave uh, the OLED group in Kodak. I feel badly about leaving them and coming to Imagine. But uh, because the CEO asked me, how did I get back into manufacturing? And he gave me $10 million in the display industry. So I left for Imagine. That was the other fork in the road. But I've always paid attention to what, expanding what I'm doing. And that gave me more opportunities uh, Every three years, they would give me another thing that they wanted me to do. Success, expanding, 
learn everything you can about not only what you're doing, but what everybody else is doing around you. And if they need help, you go there and help them. And that's the type of thing that has is, is helped me. But it's also I'm passionate about that, and I'm passionate about making sure the team wins. Well, thank you. Um, for me personally, when I had a fork in the road many years ago, it was in the year 2006, I was working for Sharp. We were uh, the most profitable display company in the world at the time, fairly large. Um, and then I get a call from a recruiter from this relatively unknown company named E Inc, based in the Boston area. So we started, uh, you know, uh, I'm also an engineer, I was a geek, I wrote down all the things, you know, on a spreadsheet and everything. Finally it came down to, it snows in Boston, should we really go there? <laughs> Best mistake I ever made, uh, going working and uh, got to work with Jim yeah. and uh, the company went from nothing to about a billion dollars in two and a half years. Um, one of the joys that I have when um, I um, work with uh, uh, panels like this where um, uh, uh, we have panelists and speakers that are very distinguished. They have a tremendous background. You learn a lot and uh, you get to appreciate. And uh, you know, I, I'm constantly inspired by uh, different people. As I was looking around the room, my friend uh, Dr. Fred Kahn is here, and uh, he once I had the opportunity one time to introduce him in the audience, and he had a fork in the road, which is uh, you know, way when he was very young, uh, it was absolutely inspiring to me. He could have turned out to be one of the, uh, he's a child prodigy in terms of being a musician. Instead, he chose to work in the display industry and he invented some fundamental LCD technologies that went into the original HP calculator when he worked for, uh, uh, I believe, David Packard at HP. Mm -hmm. And I've been very inspired since the day I introduced him. So I just want you to please uh, get up for a second, Fred, and be recognized in our industry. Thank you very much for your time. <clears throat> With that, um, what I'm going to do is we are roughly halfway through the session. So I'm going to pause and take two questions from the audience. You'll to go out in the corridor into that uh, microphone. Um, and then toward the end, I will leave time for more questions. I see John getting up. John probably, oh, you're not looking for coffee. You're looking, I was going to ask a question. <laughs> Very good. I drank online. <laughs> so so uh, I'm John Brewer with Amorphix. Yes. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, John. Um, I run a startup company that will probably never be able to raise a Series A in the United States and yet start revenue this year. Um, I come from the semiconductor industry. I've raised like $150 million for some RF semiconductor startups over the years. I know everybody who's ever been in venture capital in the semiconductor industry. I've talked to all of them about my company, which replaces semiconductors with quantum tunneling in the back plane. Eventually, when you get deep enough in with the VCs in the US, you get to this sentence, and I'm gonna quote one guy from Manhattan. The display industry is not, the display industry is non-deterministic. So under the title of seceding in the display industry, what the hell do you do with the display industry is non-deterministic? <laughs> well, thank, thank you, that's what I told the VC when he said it. I said, I only have a bad first degree, I don't know what that means, but. yeah. But I, I think, you know, what he was trying to go for is, is that, and this was 18 months ago when he said, what he was trying to go for is, is that when you look at the industry, there is a fanning out of technologies, not a conversion. There's no, there's no uh, coalescence of a path. And every one of those paths is now fragmenting into more and more paths. I think I saw nine papers today on nine different versions of CAAC, IGSO, TFTs. How does that converge back? And I'm going to also jump, and Dave's going to want to talk about this part because he and I come from semiconductors yeah. where you do 80% of your design and simulation, and when you go to the fab, the second pass is done. Right. Not in this industry. It's not possible to simulate. So I'll right. try to pull those things together. Good question, John. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, maybe I could just start, but you guys. Please um, do. And I think. Uh, um, the display industry in semiconductor to a degree, it, it is tough to get funding, and um, and I think there's a couple things. You know, one, it, it is difficult to understand the technology. I think uh, if you're trying to get funding, you know, one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, there, there's always trends in the industry, right? And so trying to latch into automotive or you know smart cities or AI or or, or, or something around that, and then being able to take your technology into how you're gonna solve a piece of that. Um, maybe one way to at least keep investors in the room, because usually I, when you say display, you gotta grab them by the collar just to 
just to say the second word. Um, so I think that's part of it, and I think you know, besides the technology, you know, trying to have what you mentioned earlier, you know, a, a, a realistic. It's, it always has to be a growth plan, and it has to be where you can see doubling, tripling, but it has to be realistic too. You see, so many times, uh, f you know, founders will come in and they have just such a hockey stick growth that the investors know they're they're not in touch with reality. Not not saying that about you, John, but that, that that's. That's it. So I, I think those are, you know, to me, those are some of the, the, the things about, about how to do it. I think later on we talk a little bit about where display is going. I could get into, I think, how you can tie a little bit more. Because I think display is going to have a lot of different technologies that are going to have to answer the holistic demand for display. Because I, I think it's huge. But those would be some of the things I think, you know, that you can try and at least get the, them to wrap their head around this non-deterministic is, is heading for a, a larger, uh, you know, benefit to society, per se, so I don't know yeah. if that, that helps. But. I mean, uh, I, c I can't speak for the venture industry writ large about, uh, you know, display investing. Uh, I know it's sparse compared to, you know, say, SaaS software, which is, you know, enormous and, and uh, super, certainly consumer, you know, Ubers and things like that. Um, you know, I, I, I'll just speak to what, you know, how we, how we look at things. So we're, um, we, we're committing $150 million, uh, out of this fund to just display. Um, uh, that could be, you know, fundamental, you know, new physics or, or new materials, all the way over to, you know, software that, you know, helps, uh, you know, create new markets for the displays that LGD already uh, already makes and, and sells in the marketplace. Um, uh, but I, you know, I think we've got probably one of the bigger pools uh, of, of money going after it, um, and <clears throat> we, uh, uh, you know. Again, maybe it's, it's, it's both a benefit and a curse, but we rely pretty heavily. I'm not a display expert. I, I've done most of my investing in, in software. Um, uh, but when, when you know, deals come in, the first thing I do is take it to our team. Uh, we have, uh, on our staff, we have uh, someone who spent uh, 15 years at LG Display. Uh, he's part of our team, so he's not part of LGD, but he, he spent 15 years there. Uh, he helps do a first pass initial vet. He, he takes every startup that we meet we take and plug into multiple places at LG Display and LG Electronics, if, if that's appropriate as well, because they are on the sales side of a lot of display products. Um, uh, and we also uh, uh, have, we ha on top of the gentlemen we have on our team, there's uh, three gentlemen who sit in our office as well, who are from LG Corp, the open innovation team, uh, whose job it is to, uh, uh, again, find inroads for startups. So we're not, Again, we have 150 million. We're looking to, you know, invest early stage, write checks one to ten, all that kind of stuff, make make money. But the other thing that we're trying to do is citizens in kind of the display industry in Silicon Valley writ large is we're trying to help companies uh, figure out the right way to interact with a big company like L LGD um, or LG Electronics. Um, and, and part of that, uh, and I've seen this play out a number of times, is again for young entrepreneurs or maybe inexperienced entrepreneurs in this in this market to understand, okay, what, you know, I've got this neat thing, idea, whatever it is, you know, what do I need to show somebody like LGD to be taken seriously, right? And that's, and that's a lot of the feedback we give. We love what we see, because we see so many startups. We love what we see, you know, you're doing great on this aspect. Here's the three variables you're not thinking about because you're not close to a fab, right? We have guys who all, all they care about, and most of our guys all they care about is, can I take this thing and make it manufacturable in our fab today, given that we've sunk billions and billions of dollars into the LCD fab, into the OLED fab, right? Um, uh, so it's, um, uh, again, I, I don't know if I can answer your question, but I, that hopefully gives you some insight into how, how we operate and how we think about investing. Well, you also said that don't give, ever give up. So yeah. I'm going to encourage John to keep coming after right. you until you fund him. Exactly. And Mate Zalar, who's in the, in the audience, is also going to be raising funds. Mate, you heard uh, what Rob said. You don't don't uh, accept no for an answer. Exactly. Um, so uh, instead of two questions, we'll just do that one. And I, I want to come back and ask the audience uh, another question, which is uh, we are here hosted by SID. Um, this is an organization that has constantly undergone change. We are, I would say, at the peak. Right, as, as Helga put it, in terms of pretty much most aspects of it. This is when companies, if you're a company, you should start worrying about what happens. You know, from the peak, there is usually, you know, <laughs> one possible direction to go there, you know, unless you see other peaks in front of you. So, um, Andrew, you've been uh, going to display meets for quite a while. You know the industry well. Um, 
what are some things SID could be doing that it's not doing? Well, to me, you know, I, I mentioned the uh, item that I'm interested in is what do the markets look like? And I think that uh, discussions about that as well would be uh, of great interest. So more discussions like that. Meetings like this where uh, you get to ask questions and get some answers. So science is great and the R&D is great, very important to me and, and my company, but we, al we also have to look at the outside world. Where, where do I see AR and VR going? So I think that's something that would be very helpful to me. And I would imagine a lot of people would like to see that too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of the industry, uh, you know, we are all doing different things uh, in our careers in this industry. Where do you guys see uh, the market going in the next few years? What are some trends that you're seeing that we can take advantage of? Uh, if I'm a company or I'm an individual and I want to pursue something um, that I don't quite see today that you think will happen three years from now? Um, um, I guess what, what I see, and maybe this ties together, I think, I think displays are, are reaching a point where uh, you know, I think earlier at, at one of the keynotes they talked about you're going to see a display on every surface basically. Um, and we're going to be, we're going to see multiple different technologies, right? So I, you know, I don't think I'm the right expert to talk about the different technologies. But what I think is the challenge of the industry, and if you kind of go back and look at the semiconductor industry as a model, part of what, you know, if you look at today where we have IoT and we just have you know, AI exploding and you have so many different people designing chips. At the core of that, what started that to me to a degree is, is the fabulous or the foundry system and, and creating, you know, a, a foundry environment and, and IP blocks and, you know, design enablement areas so that, you know, really you could take the creative of a much broader community to design products and have somebody that's focused on the technology to put those products on and move them forward. And if you think we didn't, if you think about semiconductor, we didn't have the foundries today. You'd have three or four probably companies that would be dominating almost all integrated circuit design. And then can you imagine trying to do low power IoT or large SOCs? It'd, it'd just be a different environment. And I think the display industry for us, we think it's at that crossroad. I mean, like you know, Sri's holding his his phone over there, and if you kind of take the well, there's a display everywhere, and you start to connect with with, um, you know, with the IOT. Well, this, this, the arm of this chair would probably have a display. He wouldn't even have his phone and, you know, his, it'd read his fingerprint or something and, you know, the questions he's looking at would come up right here, right? So, but to get to that means that displays are gonna change from a rectangular format to, uh, you know, almost any kind of free-flowing format and we'll have specific designs. And you, I think we need a design enablement community to, to be able to do that and then you know, again, at the same time, what, what's then, if you look at today, you never would have guessed that the foundries are leading technology for semiconductors over what, what we used to call the IEDMs because they're not vested in the design, which the IEDMs are, they're vested fully in creating the best and most competitive technology to attract people with their designs to make it. So we would have, you know, display, fo you know, people focused on creating the best display technology that, that would fit for these designs. And I think that's part of where I think the industry, we think it's, people are starting to talk about it, but I think, I, I think that's a good shift we'd see over the next three years that mm -hmm. would really help this industry uh, expand to the next level. So. Rob, where are you putting your money on bets yeah. three years out? Yeah, I, I don't want to talk about specific technologies because it, it might tip the hand a little bit of, of, <laughs> of, of you know, where, where LED is going. Um, I, I will say trend-wise, um, <clears throat> uh, I, I think there's something very clear going on, which is you know the the commodity market, like uh, for display, as we have seen for the commodity market for mobile phones and other things, is going to be dominated by the Chinese. So uh, you know, any you know any of you in the room who are thinking about playing in that in that end of the market, be afraid. <laughs> um, if you've got IP that you think helps that end of the market, you know, focus like crazy on how do I get, you know, how do I take this to China and how do I pr protect my IP? Because if you don't protect your IP, it's gonna get copied in some way. And, and that, and you know, and all the, you know, fabrication again of the commodity end of the market is gonna be in China. So, you know, as, you know, as we think about deploying our, again, 150 million that we've got earmarked for display investing, 
we're thinking about you know, how do we make investments that take, continue to take LG and LG Display, LG Electronics up market to kind of more premium services, premium offerings, you know, better quality display, better quality services around the display, um, uh, because we know that we've got to go uh, up market because staying, uh, you know, or, or trying to compete in the commodity end, uh, you know, at the Best Buys and you know, three hundred dollars for, uh, you know, fifty-five inch UHD TV, that kind of thing, um, you know, that's that's a fool's errand. Mm. I'm going to switch to um, from uh, industry trends and company related to back to more personal kind of thing. Um, could each of you cite some of, you know, maybe two or three of habits that you formed uh, fairly early in your career that you continue to uh, this day that you believe is a reason that you were successful and the reason that you're able to sustain uh, your success? Maybe start yeah, I, I've mentioned uh, before, so I apologize that uh, I've always liked to learn where I am, what all the things around me. So maybe I'm blessed with a physics background. I learned about the manufacturing. I remember sitting with somebody who was telling me, I wasn't doing finance then, and he was talking about, uh, I need to put in a new piece of equipment. He was talking about the pressure volume. I said, oh, the ideal gas law. And he looked at me like, how did you know that? That, for me, was very helpful. I learned uh, finance. Uh, not only uh, for that type of thing, but uh, how do you estimate unit costs and all sorts of things. So I always, th that was key to me. Learn everything about what it is you're doing, not just your job. Mm -hmm. And that allowed me to do many things. And I, I'll just give you another example. So in the strategy, I was, uh, the company, this is in Kodak, so I wasn't in OLED yet, and the company said, we need to do something different. Really take a look at what it is we do. And at that time, Kodak had a pharmaceutical group. And the pharmaceutical group, I don't know, if you have ethical drugs and, and you have a over-the-counter group, the ethical drugs come off of uh, prescription, go into the over-the-counter. And I said, okay, what's in the eth ethical drug market? Oh, it's stuff that goes into your blood so that the dye can show up uh, on imaging. So wh what was my comment? You don't need the uh, over-the-counter. It doesn't do us any good. You ought to get rid of the whole thing. You might know that Kodak did sell the pharmaceutical business. And I said the same thing about the Eastman Chemical Company. Of course, that's doing much better than Kodak <laughs> now. <laughs> but uh, I said, uh, you know, we use some fine chemicals. That's it. Why do you need this? So that's a type of thing to branch out and be willing to take a risk. They could have shot me after saying those types of things. But I, uh, it, it was uh, probably the right thing to do. And the only thing I argue about what we in Kodak did that was wrong, should have put more effort into OLED and gone forward with that mm. instead of the printer business. Mm. Don't tell them I said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are recording this, and I'm yeah. going to put it on YouTube. <laughs> OK, then. I'm dead. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Rob, what are some of your habits? Yeah, you um, so uh, I think like a lot of people in this room, uh, you know, I look at my to-do list. And I've got more things on my to-do list than there are hours in the day. You know, even if I, you know, didn't, you know, for some reason didn't have to sleep, I could always fill every hour a day with something that would really be of value, right? So, um, you know, I, I think the ability to kind of ruthlessly prioritize and not only focus on, you know, kind of okay, what is the most important thing uh, on my list, thinking strategically, uh, but also kind of cross-referencing that with. What are the, the most important things on my list where I can add a lot of value individually, right? And that, and that value could be making connections between people. It could be spending time doing a certain you know, piece of analysis, you, whatever, right? Um, and, and I think it ties into, this concept ties into a little bit uh, of uh, kind of professional development of people uh, that you manage. Uh, you know, I, frequently I see with bad managers, people who are protective of their uh, of kind of the gates, you know, th that they you know keep and and that and they and they open up, um, and they're they're very bad. You know, bad managers are bad delegators, um, and and every you know at every point in my career, I've always been trying to offload, delegate as much, like aggressively delegate as much of my job as possible. I mean, even to the point where, you know, it's like, okay, am I really doing anything anymore if I've got you know people on, under me, you know, doing doing my job, but that, you know, 
that serves multiple purposes. One, it frees up my time to, again, think about, okay, what, is, what are the high value things that I can be doing, um, uh, and then you know, finding ways to, to, to kind of, because the things that I don't think are high value will be high value for somebody else. It'll bring their career along, they'll get exposure to something new. Um, so so you know, turning that dynamic into a win-win rather than think of it as, thinking of it as a burden uh, you know, has, has kind of you know, yielded a lot of fruit for me. Very good point. A few years ago, I went and uh, I was talking to um, some customers uh, and, uh, and they had some issue and I said, we will take care of it. And Jen, who was part of my team, said, what he's talking about is the global we, and she was referring to another colleague saying, yeah. this is going to get delegated to you as soon as we are done with this. <laughs> I didn't realize I was doing that yeah. until she pointed this out. Yeah, right, you remember right. this, Jen? <laughs> yeah. uh, Dave, same question. Yeah, I think a couple of things. I think, uh, but similarly, but you know, ne never stop learning, and also be open to learn. I think you know, so so those are slightly subtle, different things. But I'll give you an example for me. Right there's, you know, four and a half years ago, I came into this industry, EDA. There's, you know, it could would it would have been very easy to say I have no idea about EDA and I'm too old to learn, and gone off and have done something else. But instead, to embrace, you know, there's some things I that are that are similar that I can build off of, but to learn forward. So always, always focus on learning. I think uh, I always call it, you always hustle. Um, you always hear people say, well, work smart, work smart and not hard. Um, there's a lot of people that work smart and hard. And I think it's, you know, just there, you're in a competitive environment at all times. And I think you have to do that. And probably one of the other ones that I, I think is key is always do the right thing for your company and your, and your customer, right? So you, you really have to put your agenda behind, you know, the best teams you say are the ones that kind of, you know, their agenda goes off at the door like a backpack and everybody is there for, for the problem for the, for the company. And I think those, you know, along with everything else, those, those three mm -hmm. things kind of, you know, are things you can, if you deliver on those, your career, I think, moves forward you know, very Thank well. Thank you. That's yeah. very good advice. Thank you so much. Um, we'll turn over once again audience uh, questions. If there are no pressing questions, I'm sure I'll point at one of you and ask you a question. Mm -hmm. uh oh. Uh, some of you are used to my service. Please, I'm glad that you. I know. Uh, Dave Hoborn says it was very good that somebody that was going to point at him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is James Stewart. I'm from a small startup out of Toronto uh, called Amber Molecular. Um, you've clearly all had tremendous amount of success uh, throughout the course of your career um, with large companies, with with startups. Um, so I'd like to talk about failure. Um, and I was wondering, it's it's something that I'm sure entrepreneurs in this room have to deal with daily. Uh, you're coming up across barriers, across obstacles, across various forms of failure. So I was wondering if you could maybe share uh, with us what in the course of your either own entrepreneurial journeys or working with entrepreneurs, what your most important failure was. So what was, what was the thing that went sideways that without that you wouldn't have been able to move forward? Good question. In fact, that was on my list. So thank you for <laughs> taking that. <laughs> Any of you? Failures is a fun yeah. thing to talk yeah. about. That's why you see them silent, right? It's not easy to talk about I mean, failures. I can, I, I can start, I guess. Yeah, but but uh, um, I think one, and so if you look at today, I mentioned Silvaco is doing a blend of you know, acquisitions as well as organic growth. So um, when in my last company, we had taken on a very big acquisition. It was actually larger than us. And we also did it right during the dot-com bust. So it, it almost killed the company. And we wound up diluting the shareholders you know, pretty aggressively. And we, we survived that and made it through. But later on, then I took a strategy to drive more organic growth and, and I wasn't interested in diluting the shares or, or, or bringing in, in outside money. So we, we, we explained the plan and we got a lot of support for it and we did a pretty bold thing. We went into you know, etching, it's a $4 billion etching market against Applied and Lamb, and, and there were some key things we had. But the, the time, the, you know, the development and the cycle of pure organic growth, uh, you know, brought us, you know, it was a big challenge, and we were introducing just as the 09 crisis hit. And so I think, you know, one of the things I learned was looking back on it was, you know, trying to, you know, really putting too many eggs in one basket or focusing like that versus having done a blend of, some organic and inorganic growth probably would have served the company better. So I think that's one area that, as we went into 09, it, it really kind of 
dampened our main strategic thrust at that time, and then we had to do some shifts. So I don't know if that, that helps, but that's, that was a big learning for me. So. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, so I started in venture capital in 2001. Um, I've, I've made, uh, so I, you know, I've, I've sold a lot of companies. Uh, uh, if you look at my bio, you, you can see them all. Uh, but I've made you know, a m multiple, many more bad investments. I've made so many bad investments. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, each one is a learning experience in so many ways. And so you know, in some senses, uh, you know, I'm you know, now at this, you know, uh, in this role at my firm, uh, hi, you know, I think I'm hired because of the successes that, that I have on my resume. But I think I'm effective at what I do because of the failures. failures right? Because you, yeah. you, 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 people actually learn very little in success, in success right? Everything kind of goes the right way. Mm -hmm. Everybody says, you know, oh, it's because of you know, this, that, and the other. But a lot of times, there's just a lot of luck right, involved. Right? I mean, people, you know, you know, Microsoft versus the other people doing you know, DOS-based uh, OSs at the time. Right? I mean, they just kind of happen to be in the right place at the right time. Right? Uh, uh, but it's, but it, you know, it's in your failures that you pick up, you know, very specific lessons about, you know, I mean, I've invested in a lot of companies that uh, have failed because they couldn't sell product, right? Um, uh, and so there's just a lot of nitty gritty in there about, okay, what are, you know, how do you build a sales team? Uh, how, do you go to, how do you go to market in certain uh, areas that, again, you just on the ground learn and, and uh, again, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's so much more reinforced when you fail, right? Those, that, that gets etched in your brain. The success is just kind of, you know, kind of, uh, all kind of wash over you, I guess. So in the interest of time, I'm going to go to Fred mm -hmm. for his question, and then you uh, can come back and Andrew. I, I'm sure Andrew's got something. A Andrew, this is directed at you. Uh oh, oh, there you go. <laughs> well, this is my first failure now. <laughs> yes, sir. No, I really liked your description of the uh, decisions you had to make at uh, Kodak and Imagine, and how you wished. Uh, Kodak had maybe pursued the OLED more intensively. Yes. But I want to flash back a little, maybe 20 years earlier. Uh oh. When I entered the liquid crystal field, it was December 1968. I had suggested to NEC in Japan that we could smear these things on a uh, semiconductor and make their domains visible. And they said, that's a very interesting idea but we don't have any liquid crystals here, so learn something about them and bring some with you. And it turned out at that time, there were two places, Kodak was the world's leader in liquid crystals. Oh my. <laughs> so they had more liquid crystals and more information about liquid crystals available than anyone else. Wow. And there was a, a pure and fine chemical company that also, uh, sold them. Now, you apparently had something to do with the selling of Eastman chemicals. So the question is, should Kodak have pursued that business more intensively? Did they make the right decision, and why? Well, hi hindsight, or the, I wasn't there in 1968, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, uh, I, in hindsight, I think uh, Kodak did, had this great abilities in the materials business, and that's, by the way, why they got into the pharmaceutical, but that was very different. So I think in the liquid crystal side, they should have spent more time there too, absolutely. But, uh, and, and on the OLED time side as well, that, uh, you know, the OLED was, uh, was a great technology. They, uh, they invented it in some fashion, some people believe, Ching Tang does, he believes that. And they, uh, they started doing things like, uh, I, I had to license people because they wanted patents for the printer field. Mm -hmm. And hey, I, I'm a company guy, I do what it takes. So I, I would agree that uh, they should have spent more time in OLED, but I'm a biased person probably, and they should have spent more time in liquid crystal. You know, it's a big industry, so I think uh, they missed that too. Yeah. I don't know where though, that was it made in Eastman Chemical? I don't know for sure. Yeah. You know, I, yeah, I, I yeah, bought them from Kodak in Rochester. Well, that would be more. <laughs> that would be more likely. It would be my guess. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think things like that would, uh, that would have been a great thing to go after. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Uh, Thank you. With that, we are at uh, the end of our appointed hour. I'd like to keep this on time. Uh, let's thank our panelists uh, for a wonderful job. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing each of you in next year's uh, CEO Forum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.